Hi everyone and welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about preference assessment interviews. I have three PowerPoints about preference assessments. There's three different ways to do it and we're going to initially talk about the interview process. A lot of this information can be used for any type of interview, not just preference assessment interviews. It's nice for you all to have a little bit of background in interviewing and how to do it in a reliable way that produces good data because you might do other types of interviews as a behavior tech. What is a preference assessment? It's our methods that we use for identifying reinforcers. So preference assessments help us learn what the learner likes, values, or finds enjoyable. Interview is an indirect assessment approach. So preference assessments fall on this sort of triangle similar to FBAs. And on this sort of triangle at the very bottom, what has the least precision is the easiest to do it would be interviews or indirect approaches. This provides valuable insight so learners and caregivers can provide valuable insight into the learner's preferences. You can also ask the learner themselves. This is when a student is speaking or a client is speaking, a lot of times this is the preferred way to find their preferences is their interviews and rating skills. You can just have a conversation about it. It's a really efficient way to gather information. You're asking direct questions so you get very direct answers quickly. It builds rapport with the learners as well as the caregivers. You get to learn more about the family, more about the individual. It's suitable for verbal or AAC users, so if they can communicate directly and express their preferences, you're probably going to utilize interviews. And it confirms the preferences across different sources, so you can interview multiple people who know the learner well to help validate the findings of your interviews. So who should be interviewed for preference assessments? The learner, when appropriate, that's usually the best person to ask when they're verbal. They know what they like. They know what they'll work for. Very rarely do I find that kids don't give you truthful answers in these types of interviews because they know it's leading to them potentially getting these things that they want. They have a lot of motivation to be honest with you. Sometimes they don't know what their preferences are. So in that case, it might be kind of odd data, but most of the time they know. Parents or caregivers are a good one. When a student is not verbal or not speaking, you can use parents or caregivers to learn their interests and motivations. A lot of people, when you're doing these quicker FBAs, that might be your only method just to ask them really quickly. You can also ask teachers or therapists or other people who know the learner. Professionals who work with the learner will know this. They're speech pathologists or occupational therapists. They all should have a general knowledge of what they like. And then you want to make sure you're looking at multiple sources to help confirm consistent preferences. So... One is just open-ended, so it would be really broad. What are your favorite things to do after school? What do you like to do at home? What do you like in the school? Like, what would you like to have at school? Or what activities would you like to do? Choice space is another one. So you give them two options. Do you like puzzles or games more? Do you like iPad time or playing outside more? Yes or no questions are also often a checklist. And there's some really huge checklists of all the possible things a child might want to work for. You want to go through it and cross out the things you could not provide. There's some on Teachers Pay Teachers. So you can get these giant checklists and go through it with the student and mark off what they like. And then I ask them to rank them after that. So I have a rank order. That's my most used method. Especially in schools, there's a lot of unique things on these checklists that you might not think of, like saying morning announcements, having lunch with the principal, those kind of other fun activities a student might like. For example, there was all this, my kids' school just dolphin dollars, so they earn dolphin dollars and they can turn them in for things. One thing that my child saved up for was there's SRO officers, so student resource officers who are police officers who are on campus 
for not only education, but safety of students. For $200 dolphin dollars, which took him almost all year, you could have a ride in the police car with the policeman. And that was a big deal. So there's things like that. You can get very creative. Even at home, there can be really creative things. I've seen where if they have a lot of siblings one-on-one -on -one time with parents, like dad takes you for ice cream alone. You can come up with them. So it's nice to have those checklists because it kind of broadens your ideas of what is reinforcing. And it does give the kids some unique or the client you're working with some unique ideas for what they might want and they may never have thought of that but when they think about it, they're like oh yeah I would like that so that's fun to do with kids and you can also ask situational questionals questions where you ask the learner what would they do if they could do anything right now what would it be so you make it more of an imaginary game Sample preference prompts, things we might ask about, favorite snacks or drinks. Not a huge fan of edibles of any type for therapy or reinforcers. Food is our fuel, essentially. Food is something that we all need. And I think when you combine that with these reinforcing contingencies, it gets confusing for people. Whether they're verbal, nonverbal, every person in this world, I feel, should have access to healthy food that they enjoy. And I know a piece of candy is not part of their nutritional food that they need every day, but I still think that can be confusing because a piece of candy is food. So I stay completely away from that now. <laughs> Things you could use is preferred toys or games, interest when bored, like iPad time or puzzles, motivating rewards, specific items that really motivate the learner. So you'd come up with those things and ask them. So tools that we can use is we have a couple ways we can do this. One is there are reinforcement assessment data sheets to record preferences and reinforcement value. So these are forms that allow them to rank order their preferences. Preference checklists, they're all over. I would, everybody should have a very large one. You can create them. Again, teachers pay teachers. There's some free ones on there. You get this preference checklist and make a Word document or try to purchase it or gather it in a Word document so you can continually add things that you think of. And then before you do it with the child, you just cross off all the things that you can't provide them in that setting. I'd use a Sharpie so they can't read it. You might get, if you just cross it and they see it, they're like, no, no, I really want that. And you're like, well, I can't provide you that for whatever reason. Like the family doesn't have a car to drive. So go out for a drive to ice cream. A structured interview form. So customizable templates to guide preference interview process. Those exist. You might need pictures or icons depending on the communication preferences or how the person communicates. You want to make it really conversational, kind of fun. Make sure it's relaxed. Make sure they're in a good mood to do this. You don't want any behaviors had just occurred or might occur. You want to use visuals, show them things. I've had to like pull things up on my phone to show them when they don't understand a word or don't understand something. Take notes or record audio if you have permission. It does help. Clarify unclear responses with follow-up questions. So if they're being kind of vague, like maybe, maybe you would ask, maybe I would like that and say, is there something I could change about that to make you like it? Like for recess time and they're like, maybe I would like a little recess time. Well, what if we just go free time? Is there somewhere you would want free time that's like recess time? And they say, oh, I'd like it in the sensory room or I'd like it in the library. If it was in the library, I would like it. So then you just modify that. Validate their answers. There are no wrong responses. So you want to make sure you acknowledge whatever they say, but you might want to validate it with teachers, parents. After this, you might want to conduct a direct preference assessments. You want to use preferred items as reinforcers for new or difficult tasks. And then you'll revisit the interview periodically. You want to continually assess to make sure we have very reinforcing items. If the items you're utilizing are not reinforcing, 
the therapy doesn't work. So we always have to make sure we're using reinforcing items. I have had people come to me with like nothing motivates this child. There's nobody in this world that nothing motivates. What it is is you just don't know what motivates them yet. And so it has to become an assessment so we can figure that out. What does motivate them? <laughs> there are things in this environment every person is motivated by. It's just the nature of the human experience. Sometimes it takes more time or interviewing or assessment to figure that out. Preference interviews are a great way to start the preference assessment process. Sometimes they're the only piece you need, but sometimes you need more. They help personalize the intervention and increase motivations. They should be thoughtful, respectful, and very learner-centered. Whether you're talking to parents or the learner themselves, we want to make sure that we're, it's their, that learner's motivation. So like that should be the center of everything. And then you want to combine it with other types of assessment to make it very comprehensive. That's not always 100% necessary, but a lot of times it is best practice. Thank you. I'll see you next video.